You are listening to Moderate Rebels, and here are some highlights from our upcoming interview with Carrie Ann Mendoza, the editor in chief and founder of the British news website The Canary. You know, if we had ha half decent media in this country that could actually link the policies that are happening in the Conservative Party to the crushing austerity that people are feeling, you know, their libraries are closing, they can't get an appointment on the NHS, these types of things. Um, we could really get somewhere, but at that point, it's kind of like basically the issue, all of your issues, people are being told, are because of immigration and because of the EU. And obviously, we now know the full ramifications of using those two scapegoats to kind of cover really for neoliberalism, the failures of neoliberalism. We had anticipated that the people that we'd be most upset about the canary being a success wouldn't be the right. It would be the Guardianistas, it would be this kind of liberal, neoliberal um, strain of journalists who they really see themselves, particularly over the last 10 years, as like, we fight the fights of the working classes. We don't actually have to employ any black people or any working class people or any disabled people. We are so progressive and so liberal not least because of the racism and the <laughs> classism that was on open naked display from these apparently so progressive um, journalists. Well, not even journalists, they're columnists, let's be clear. Yeah, pundits. Yeah, they're, pun they're not going around creating their own investigations. You know, they're, they're Westminster tittle-tattle people. They're not travelling outside of the M25 to do any of this work, which is, you know, one of the things that really miffed me about this was the idea that these journalists who've never risked more than a blister in the name of journalism, you know, are kind of looking at guys like Max who literally risk their lives and calling them bloggers. They're trying to kill our distribution methods, as you guys know, in the States as well, with prominent Facebook pages on the left, just being <laughs> stripped, you know, just taken down without, you know, rhyme or reason. And it's really clear that they're trying to work the algorithms to downgrade pages that are promoting progressive content. And the basic assumption that you have to, and I mean have to, accept in order to operate long term in those circles, whether it's the Guardian or the Sun or wherever, whichever other paper you want to pick, is that it's, this is the nub. Capitalism is reformable. The only reason stuff's not working is because this, uh, a, you know, X, Y, Z leader uh, isn't doing capitalism right. And so we'll do capitalism right. That's, that's it. That's the breadth of the argument. That's as far as you're allowed to take it. And if you go to the point where you're saying, guys, I think the problem might actually be capitalism. I think there's some serious issues with this system and we need to look at transitioning to an alternative, you know, not only to save the planet, literally, you know, we're, we're killing the planet for the sake of profit right now, but also, you know, to decrease instances of war, to, you know, redistribute wealth amongst more people, all of these things, it would be possible if we organized it a different way. That is like, you might as well grab a gun, basically, because the, the way you're looked at when you make that argument, it, I mean, they just quickly go to militant, extremist, as if anything outside of this narrow little window that they've got is far anywhere. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, Jeremy Corbyn's platform isn't far left. It's just left. You know, it was perfectly normal a couple of decades ago to say the, the types of stuff, stuff that he's saying. But by the standards of today, you are an absolute card-carrying, flag-waving extremist if you mess with that basic assumption Capitalism is reformable. You're just not doing it right. Well, and what's wild is that's considered extremist, but not people who think that corporations should be allowed to destroy the planet and the potential for human life to continue to exist for profit. That's not an extremist position. Like ExxonMobil should be able to destroy humanity. Ben, that's just business. That's just business. <laughs> I'll never apologize for the United States of America, ever. I don't care what the facts are. Why are we going to sit down and talk to these quote-unquote moderate rebels? Who are the truly moderate rebels? The search for the moderate rebel. Do these moderate rebels exist?
moderate rebels. This is Moderate Rebels, and I'm Ben Norton here with Max Blumenthal. Today we're joined by the editor and founder of the left-wing British news website, The Canary. Uh, her name is Carrie Ann Mendoza, and she's also a journalist in her own right and the author of Austerity, The Demolition of the Welfare State and the Rise of the Zombie Economy. Carrie Ann has been really leading a kind of war in the past few months against The Guardian, and there's been this kind of uh, you know left-wing war going on where The Guardian, which has traditionally been the voice of conventional wisdom, if you will, in London, it's, you know, supported many wars, including the Iraq War. Uh, it really occupies this kind of Blairite position in British politics. And The Canary, um, Carrie Ann, you founded The Canary in 2015 as a kind of left-wing alternative to websites like The Guardian. Uh, it's been very supportive of Jeremy Corbyn since he was elected leader of the Labour Party. So I'm wondering if you could just begin our conversation here. Um, can we talk about why you founded The Canary and what led you to this battle with The Guardian that you're in? Yeah, well, we set up The Canary because really out of sheer frustration, it was actually the morning after the 2015 general election where the Tories not only managed to scrape through and get a government, but they actually got a majority back. And I just lost it that morning. I was just like, this is turkeys voting for Christmas. You know, if we had ha half decent media in this country that could actually link the policies that are happening in the Conservative Party to the crushing austerity that people are feeling, you know, their libraries are closing, they can't get an appointment on the NHS, these types of things. Um, we could really get somewhere. But at that point, it's kind of like, Basically, the issue, all of your issues, people are being told, are because of immigration and because of the EU. And obviously, we now know the full ramifications of using those two scapegoats to kind of cover, really, for neoliberalism, the failures of neoliberalism to create sustainable communities and societies. And what we have... You know, I'd been writing in the States for a number of years and, and seeing the kind of growth of the alternative media scene there from, from the inside as a, as a reporter and just thinking to myself, oh, we really need this in the United Kingdom. You know, what we'd got to was a kind of entirely neoliberal mainstream media. Forget left, right, liberal. The point is they're all neoliberal. They're just sort of the difference to me between the Daily Mail and the Guardian is the amount of hang, hand wringing that happens <laughs> about what's going on in the country. That's it. There's not a policy difference. So, yeah, we were kind of wanted to do something. And then what we also had, even though we had some left wing sites, they're very niche, they're very academic and they produce fantastic work but it's only read by a small number of people and only a small number of people to be honest have the, have the education level to read it so what we we're trying to do at the canary was create something that was absolutely accessible whatever your academic background your class background your cultural background it was something you could you could get into you could understand what the story was about and how it would affect you and your family and your kids or whatever and we also have this get involved section at the bottom of every story because we wanted to not just make people angry or upset or sad about what was happening, but channel them directly to go and do something about it and start kind of, I don't know, it's kind of training their little democratic muscles, you know, so instead of just being passive observers, they'd actually go, well, I want a piece of this. I can do something about this. So that's why we set up and um, we literally had 500 quid. We didn't take external investment you know none of us has a wealthy background I'm, I'm working class as you might be able to tell from my accent I'm not sure if it translates <laughs> well we, we are American Americans with our American accents <laughs> we can't we can't differentiate the the subtleties in British accents you all sound sophisticated to us <laughs> So I'm kind of full Pirates of the Caribbean over here with a, a West Country accent so it's Pirates <laughs> Farmers um and yeah, so we, we set up and in the first year we were a commercial success as well as being a, a red success. We turned that 500 into about a quarter of a million quid inside of our first year. Um, and I think just we, we were hoping for a quiet year. We didn't anticipate it would take off immediately. We were kind of like, we've got no money at the moment. So we're just going to gently does it for the first year. And then about eight weeks in. Um, there was a like full page article about it in, in the Daily Telegraph, which said, this is the maddest left wing website <laughs> in the world. And we were like, 
if we're anything in the world, after eight weeks, we'll take it. <laughs> Doesn't matter what it is. And then it just snowballed. And we had, you know, as you say, we had anticipated that the people that we'd be most upset about the Canary being a success wouldn't be the right. It would be the Guardianistas. It would be this kind of liberal, neoliberal um, strain of journalists who they really see themselves, particularly the last 10 years, as like, we fight the fights of the working classes. We don't actually have to employ any black people or any working class people or any disabled people. We are so progressive and so liberal that we are perfectly adequate at representing all of your views. <laughs> and that's what we're going to do. And, as they, and so when we kind of came up and, you know, a lot of our writers are disabled, they have used the benefit system. You know, they, they've got really diverse backgrounds in terms of ethnicity and class and everything else. And it just absolutely infuriated them because they love being attacked by the right. It just makes them feel more progressive because they can say, look, they hate us. We're fantastic. Um, but they really hate being held to account from a progressive point of view because it challenges their core identity, which is the home of liberal, socially progressive values. And, you know, when you're supporting Saudi Arabia and Israel and austerity, you know, you cannot call your, continue to call yourselves liberal. They, you know, these are highly illiberal um, actions that they're supporting. But, you know, I think we have that phrase, what is it, progressive except for Palestine? Yeah, yeah PEP. Yeah, so the, I would call it like progressive except for neoliberalism. You know, it's like <laughs> they'll be most progressive, but the moment that chat comes up against the neoliberal value, it's like... You know, whatever that other value is. So yeah, they really hate us. Yeah, when you you quickly realize that all of these elite neoliberal journalists and and especially elite neo, neo, neoliberal politicians, they never are challenged by the left. So when they are challenged by the left, they don't even know what to yeah. do because they're used to fighting fighting this boogeyman totally. on the right. And they they, they go, it goes through the stages. They ignore you, the, the left wing opposition. They ignore you. Then they make fun of you then they accept that you are a legitimate opposition. And then they try to destroy you utterly. Exactly. Absolutely. With the sleaziest tactics. Oh, completely. I mean, they just make stuff up, which is huge ironic when they're accusing us of fake news while simultaneously promoting just, you know, they're just making this stuff up now. Um, and obviously we'll get into the bones of that with Corbyn and with the lecture and stuff, but it really is... You know, I kind of, the, I, it was all, each year has been a different kind of education of running this. We've just had our third birthday, you know, and kind of the first year was just getting to grips with the editorial process, you know, it was making sure that the newsroom functioned, it was that kind of stuff. And then year two and three have really been about what it takes to sustain a war, you know, when people cut, like they're trying to kill our distribution methods, as you guys know, in the States as well, with prominent Facebook pages on the left, just being <laughs> stripped you know, just taken down without, you know, rhyme or reason. And it's really clear that they're trying to work the algorithms to downgrade pages that are promoting progressive content. You know, I mean, I, I have struggled, struggled to even advocate that for far right sites. You know, as a kind of free speech person, it kind of niggles me, you know, just yeah. to see them stop. So when we're talking about progressive sites, they're literally saying, hey, guys, let's share more. You know? <laughs> How about we work towards peace here rather than war here? And that's classed as some like mad, bad, dangerous um, site. You know, it needs to be dealt with, um, you know, by our holier than thou establishment. If you don't support selling billions of dollars of military grade equipment to like Wahhabi tyrannical absolute monarchy, then you're an extremist. <laughs> I know, I'm just a crazy, crazy extremist militant who doesn't want war. <laughs> well, let, let, let's talk about war a little bit. Um, I mean, I think that The Guardian has had it coming for a long time, but especially uh, now under the reign of Catherine Viner, I mean, it's just really gone kind of not just neoliberal, but neoconservative. On foreign policy, I mean, whenever I see something that just looks like straight up propaganda put forward by, you know, the British or U.S. intelligence services on Syria, I look to the Guardian. Uh, you know, they will talk about this later, but they really led the charge for regime change in Nicaragua and published so much disinformation. Uh, you know, Venezuela, whatever it is on foreign policy, they're on board with the regime change agenda. And I've had my own experiences with them. Uh, in my writing on Israel-Palestine, where basically 
Jonathan Friedland is the gatekeeper, and this is someone who really identifies with Israel in a almost hysterical way. Um, you know, so the, my, my question is kind of like, how, how have you really gotten under the Guardian skin? I know you've done the Boycott the Guardian campaign. That hashtag is really uh, seeing a resurgence today because the Guardian published a piece on how to get rid of a really bad house guest about Julian Assange. Uh, which is just absolutely disgusting since they're always claiming like our journalists are under threat by Donald Trump. And then here's like a journalist who uh, would be the first person prosecuted in the U.S. if he's uh, extradited for revealing classified information. And The Guardian is publishing a ma- like a guide on how to get rid of him, presenting him as a bad house guest. And th- this is also someone where a U.N. panel said that he is being illegally held and is not only due to be released, but due compensation. That point is never stressed enough. You know, the Guardian hand rings a lot about supposed threats against journalists, but this is someone where a U.N. panel have, has actually released a report saying that he is not legally being held. This is progressive except neoliberalism again, because the U.N. is this like holier than now authority to them when it's consistent with their ideology, when it's inconsistent, oh, it's a talking shop, it doesn't mean anything. It's Right. And they don't even blink. They don't even blink. There's not like a moment of self-realization where they go, hang on a minute, aren't these things that I'm saying completely inconsistent with each other? Maybe, just maybe, I'm operating under my own kind of confirmation bias. You know, this is what I've been waiting for. Call me optimistic, But, you know, one of my hopes was was that these people were actually genuine liberals that had kind of gone astray. They'd got a little too sheltered in their own little communities. And once we started to break them out and kind of push some arguments towards them, maybe some of them would peel off. But they didn't peel off. They circled the wagons. Yeah, it's like a South African lager. (laughs) (laughs) Ironically, very similar. (laughs) Yeah. And everybody's white. Yeah. Um, so, so I mean, talk about how you got on their, their skin, uh, the Boycott the Guardian campaign, and what they have kind of done back to you. Uh, I mean, they've been targeting you specifically in a very vicious way. It was really weird. I mean, we didn't even feel it was a war, kind of our end to begin with. We were just really clear that a lot of the stuff that they were publishing was factually inaccurate. You know, it was just wrong. It was, you know... It, whether it was literally incorrect in terms of, you know, misrepresenting people's positions, um, certainly around the anti-Semitism row that we can get into, where they just decided that anyone who advocated um, for Palestinian justice was an anti-Semite by by definition. You know, it wasn't like they had to find something that you said or did that was anti-Semitic. Right. It was just... You just simply were because that's the view you held. And they published a whole bunch of stuff about how the reason for this was because Jeremy Corbyn was letting all of these scary Muslims into the Labour Party. And obviously we all know that every Muslim hates Jews. And it was just outrageous. And I was like, this would look a little bit strongly worded in the Daily Caller. You know, but this is supposed to be the Guardian, the home of liberalism. And they're publishing right. this race baiting nonsense. So we've spent the kind of, you know, basically it kicked off with there was a coup. There was this coup attempt by the right of the Labour Party back in, I think it was 2016. Um, and they thought they had this in the bag. But we were really up and running at that point, And we were reaching millions of people a month. And we were credited by one of Owen Smith's aides, and this is one of the guys who was trying to oust Corbyn, um, as being a big part of why Jeremy Corbyn was still in place. That wasn't meant to be a compliment. It was even this fake news factory that twisted everyone's minds to like this dangerous socialism. (laughs) Um, And that really, really fundamentally pissed them off. You know, they'd had a situation where they thought, we've got this lockdown, the entire press is behind this Labour right project, we're going to walk it. And then they didn't. And I mean, it wasn't just the Canary. You know, since the Canary started, you've now got a whole bunch of other outlets that have set up, um, which was one of the things we wanted to achieve. So there was that. And then there was the 2017 general election. And that, I think, was where they really lost it, because they'd spent two years telling us that we were in an echo chamber. We were only talking to ourselves. We had no idea what was happening in the wider country. And that every single paper, including The Guardian, said that this was we have a historic landslide election win for Theresa May and the Conservatives. And right. we said, 
I don't know what planet you're living on, but we're down in the local community centres, we're down in the local schools, and we're talking to people on university campuses, and we're in factories, and we understand that the conversation is somewhat different to the one that you're having in your offices in it, London. It's somewhat different than the conversation Paul Mason had in a restaurant that was picked <laughs> up. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, even let, don't even get me started on that <laughs> conversation. But yeah, and, and that's what we'd said. And we said, we accuse you of being the echo chamber. You guys are basically all, you're like 90% white. You know, you've, you're nearly 60% male. You're more than half of you went to public school when only 7% of the rest of the country did. And you're all writing within about 50 square miles of each other down in London. And what percentage of them went to Oxbridge? I'm sure half went to Oxford, the other half to Cambridge. It's, it's high. Like, it's really, it's high. Um, Cause that's basically the route public school Oxbridge. Um, and we were saying, don't you think there's actually more of a chance that you are in a chamber than a, a, an operation like us, who literally we have our, our journalists are all over the country and around the world. They're this completely diverse group of people. And then what happened was the election happened and Labour got its highest vote share in 40 years. Just massive, um, you know, and Theresa May lost her majority, which was, was, which was the critical point, which is basically what we predicted throughout the entire period and we were really wide, widely read during that period as well and that was that was I think when they decided to go to war which was we you know we've spent two years telling people that this is a fake news website and they're still reading it <laughs> what are we gonna do and so it was just one thing you know after the next um for this whole period of time and all we've continued to do is our job which is to what well, yeah, as we describe it, which is to tell the underreported, unreported, and misreported stories of our time. That's it. That's our agenda, and we just keep doing it every day. And the fact that we're still doing it just makes them matter every single day because they hoped we'd have disbanded, you know, months, years ago, um, preferably. So yeah, and then obviously the Claudia Jones. <laughs> Memorial so talk about that. I mean, you were, uh, this is a very prestigious lecture. Um, it's overseen by the National Union of Journalists, uh, the, the, the caucus of black members, of black uh, members of the National Union of Journalists, of which you, you, you are one, and you were selected to give the Claudia Jones Memorial Lecture. Uh, talk, first of all, who, you know, who is Claudia Jones and what is the significance of this lecture? And why has The Guardian um, and these, this cast of mostly white Whitehall pundits uh, been able to kind of leverage this lecture against you? So, I mean, I was invited months. Well, for, first, first, who is Claudia Jones? And Claudia Jones is an inspiration for me as black. She's a radical feminist, l communist journalist way back. And, and, you know, this the period that she was operating is the period that my granddad came from the Caribbean to the United Kingdom. So I'm extra bonded with her for that fact is that she's Windrush Generation. You know, my granddad was, was Windrush Generation. And... She basically set up the Notting Hill Carnival, which is a massive um, event every year for, for black people in Britain and, and the wider community, to be honest, at this stage, and also set up the West Indian Gazette. So, you know, she came to this country, you know, as far as the establishment concerned, you know, she was the wrong colour, she was the wrong gender, and she had the wrong politics to ever be a part of their club. So what did she do? She set up her own club, and it was a great one. You know, it was so great. It's still going, you know, decades after she's no longer a part of a part of things. So her legacy is very much intact. You know, people who've never heard the name Claudia Jones absolutely will have heard of the Notting Hill Carnival, which she bequeathed to us all. She also coined the concept of triple oppression, which a lot of people have been influenced by and don't know who created it. Uh, it created that it was a, yeah. a feminist Marxist, a black feminist Marxist who coined the concept where triple oppression is capitalism, white supremacy, and patriarchy. It's multiple inter interlocking mm. systems of oppression. And, and that predated the concept yeah. of intersectionality by decades, going back to Claudia Jones. I mean, she was writing about this in the 50s. She was an absolute pioneer. It's like you go and read her work and you're just like, this could be written now. You know, it's so fresh. It's so raw. And like her insights are just fantastic she's a real keen observer of just humanity 
and she has a way of explaining it that I think anyone could understand, which I really appreciate. You know, there's no showboating with her writing. Her keenest interest in making sure she's communicating the idea clearly and, and in an understandable way. And it's also beautiful. So I just I just love her to bits. And I was com- just so honoured when I got the invitation um, from Mark Wadsworth and the NUJ Black Members Council. It was just, you know, an honour, not just about Claudia Jones, but it was the fact that, you know, being recognised as a black woman, you know, as a left-wing black woman who, like Claudia Jones, I'm not comparing myself to her as in greatness, but we've done a similar thing and that we've kind of looked at this, you know, establishment kind of scenario and gone, that's really not for me. Like, I want to do this kind of journalism and I'm not going to do that there. Like, that's not what that space is for. So I'm going to set up over here. (laughs) I'm going to see how it goes. And you end up creating something which, like, the platform you build is so big that you're now in eye contact with these people that before you were just kind of, you know, looking up at. And that's been a really powerful experience to have. And I was just so excited about bringing that to the lecture and creating something extraordinary. To be honest, I didn't have any clue even at the beginning that this was being hosted at the Guardian building. It was like the location was the least interesting part of the email. You know, I got it. Like, this is amazing. So it wasn't until October 11th. We're talking, I'm back in February now. Left it. And then about two weeks before the event was due to take place, um, apparently an email went out in the Guardian offices saying, hey, reminder, it's Black History Month. It's the <laughs> Claudia Jones Memorial Lecture. And the keynote address is going to be given by Kerry Ann Mendoza, editor-in-chief of the Canary. At which point, apparently Mark Stefano says there was chaos at the Guardian. <laughs> That's the BuzzFeed reporter who basically serves as the uh, kind of water carrier for the Guardian. Absolutely. He's he's totally like the handbag carrier in chief um, for Catherine Viner. <laughs> the Guardian water boy. Totally. You know, it's like, what can I do to help you out? It, I'd be embarrassed. Frank, I would be embarrassed to, to play the role that he's played in all of this not least because of the racism and the the classism that was on open naked display from these apparently so progressive um, journalists. Well, not even journalists, they're columnists, let's be clear. Yeah, pundits. Yeah, they're they're not going around creating their own investigations. They're they're Westminster tittle-tattle people. They're not traveling outside of the M25 to do any of this work, which is, you know, one of the things that really miffed me about this was the idea that these journalists who've never risked more than a blister in the name of journalism, you know, are kind of looking at guys like Max who literally risked their lives and calling them bloggers. We'll get into that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so this kicks off and I'm kind of, you know, I, I've been doing this long enough to know that you can expect to get people say horrible things about you. You know, they don't know you. They don't know your background. They've just decided on this version of you that they've created in their head. And I'm okay with that. But this started to get pretty mean, you know, and there's lots of like a Twitter pylon essentially led by these guys. And I was just like, this is, you know, and we're talking like Nick Cohen, Marina Hyde. I mean, you know, not being funny, but if it was John Pilger, you know, (laughs) tweeting me saying, I've got some real issues with you. I'd be like, oh, okay, John. School me, <laughs> you know. But when it's like some Trump, right. like Nick Cohen, when it's Nick Cohen, it's a badge of honor. I mean, it this is, is you kind of like this guy literally spoke at an event with with an ED, founder of the EDL. This is the English Defense League. These are fascists, yeah. and this guy's anyway. Yeah, and for for our American audience, Nick Cohen is the neocon in chief um, pundit. I mean, he he's and he's like a neoliberal and a neocon. Uh, he supported the Iraq war and wrote all of these ridiculous life-filled screeds, and then he kind of apologized. And then, in t- before the general election, he wrote column after column saying, Jeremy Corbyn's destroying the Labour Party, I'm going to leave the, the Labour Party because of Jeremy Corbyn, blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, when Jeremy Corbyn won seats for Labour, and not just Corbyn, but others, uh, he was totally silent yeah. and just moved on to other nonsensical attacks. I mean, he, his entire career has been one of propagating disinformation that's convenient to the ruling class, and then he just moves on to sell the next yeah. war. I mean, <laughs> being attacked by him is a badge of honor. <laughs> and so, Kerry, uh, this, this cast of this kind of grotesque gallery of neoliberals has united against you delivering the Claudia Jones Memorial Lecture and been able to um, 
kind of mobilize lots of opposition because it would be delivered in the guardian inside the guardian building this is like full-on poor doors stuff it's just like we're not going to let her in the building <laughs> we're just not so first they tried to hold a vote um and they got they actually convened this their chapel of the national union of journalists which is like their bit um <clears throat> sat down and they tried to have this vote and that what they wanted to do was vote me out. But the NUJ Black Members Council said, guys, that's not actually in your jurisdiction. You know, you're just hosting the event. You don't get to choose the speaker for, for Black History Month. So you, the choice that you get to vote is just whether you host it or not. You know, we'll take it somewhere else. So now they're really frustrated because, you know, even Nick Cohen can see, oh, God damn it, we're going to look like complete dickheads you know, <laughs> if this happens. So... They vote 35 to 8 to continue to host the event. But we were clear this was not over. Like, we knew how much anger had been in the room. Apparently, Nick Cohen was literally shouting his head off in this session, which I just still find absolutely hilarious. Um, so it all kicked off, and that was that. So I wake up the next morning, and now it's Kerry Ann Mendoza's breaking the Guardian blockade. And like, what blockade? And this is because there's been a, go- a boycott the Guardian Twitter hashtag, which was not set up by me. It was literally scheduled weeks before. Nothing to do with me. But I'd supported it because I support the fact that people are saying, why should we continue to, to buy this paper? But, you know, if you've got a guy like Nick Cohen, he literally wrote a piece calling Corbyn voters, excuse language, fucking fools. You know, if you read this piece, it's a polemic to end all polemics. Yeah. Why should people continue to give their money to a to a paper which calls them effing fools? I mean, why would you want to spend money on that? So I'd support it, and now it's turned into a blockade, a picket line that I am crossing because I want to have the prestige of giving this speech. So the speech is no longer about Claudia Jones. It's no longer the National Union of Journalists Black Members Council event. It's now the Guardian's event. It was just unbelievable. That didn't work. The story didn't take off. And even though it was covered across, I mean, there was a story on this in about five or six of our mainstream outlets. It just completely unwarranted. But still, people were like, well, that's ridiculous. It's clear that's not what she's doing. Right. It could be held anywhere. It would still be the same lecture with the same prestige. Complete. I mean, it was nuts. Um, so that didn't work. So then they got really angry. Um and then we woke up the next day. I mean, this is all happening within, you know, two or three days. And I, I just started getting tweets saying, are you happy? That journalist could have died. Oh. <laughs> and I was like, what the hell are you talking about? I, I literally have no idea what you're talking about. And then I, I find out, oh, it's because this little gaggle of same people, the same people that have been going on about this speech all week, and have now decided that the Canary has published this piece, which has got this poor, vulnerable journalist in Nicaragua who's just trying to do his job. It's got him arrested. It's got him deported. He could have been killed. Right. We couldn't possibly host an editor-in-chief who would be so reckless as to do this. And obviously, you know, we we done our groundwork on the story. It wasn't like Max sent us a story and we just went, OK, Max, we're just going to publish it you know we go through a five-stage editorial process you know where we're checking every single fact and we're doing it systematically you know and and we're looking at it and going this absolutely stands up we're happy to republish this piece this is a a strong piece of work you know max wasn't doxing anybody he wasn't giving out his person this guy has been all over his own social media Right. releasing his own details this is the more you read about this story instantly the worse it gets i'll hand over to max to give you the you know the details but it really i mean the furore around it was you couldn't make it up you know it was running in every paper in this country from right to the guardian so a little bit center right <laughs> saying these people are mad and dangerous they're, they're now they basically now they've completely gone over the line yeah. Now they're imperiling our beloved journalists. They're 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 like uh, threatening journalists. They're getting journalists tortured. Uh, except that's that's not what happened at all. Um, I actually was uh, attacked in Die Taz, which is a German paper today for this whole episode. So everybody's really mad. What I think we wound up doing though was um, 
you know, the, the Canary had been really disrupting the anti-Corbyn campaigns, which are so shabby, and it's not really about debating Jeremy Corbyn and his supporters on the merits of their agenda and the social policies they want to enact on, you know, how they want to save the NHS. It's about smearing Jeremy Corbyn as a friend of extremists and an anti-Semite and just trying to see how far you can get with that because they can't debate on these really popular policies. And so I kind of forced that I kind of uh, embarrassed them on their foreign policy coverage. They do the same thing um, in other countries where they'll reduce the entire country to one figure and then start in on that figure and yeah. it's really like a blueprint where they yeah. construct a dossier and say dictator, uh, you know, yeah. whatever, autocrat, authoritarian, and they did that with Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua. Uh, the reality on the ground was far more complex, and I know that because I spent some time in Nicaragua right after what was a U.S.-backed coup attempt and met just day after day dozens and dozens of people who had been tortured by the opposition, kidnapped, had their homes burned, were living basically through a nightmare as these, you know, these criminal gangs had taken over large parts of the country. That was never really reported by The Guardian, and I having been in Nicaragua, uh, knew about this reporter that The Guardian and The Washington Post were using named Carl David Gide Lusiak, who, um, you know, was, everybody was complaining about him down there. He had actually not just embedded himself with the opposition, including violent elements who had torn this city uh, outside Managua called Masaya to shreds and placed a police station under siege and tortured and burned people alive on video. I mean, it just unbelievable stuff. He actually was employed or claimed to be employed by an opposition radio station, which was run by a leader of a party that was funded by the United States, the Movement for the Renovation of Sandinismo. Um, you know, he was part of the opposition as an American, essentially. Per and going as close as you can to participating in a, in a coup as sort of a publicist. And I, you know, wrote about this in a publication called Mint Press, which is an anti-imperialist publication in the U.S., well after he had been exposed in Spanish on social media in Nicaragua. Uh, and, you know, he started complaining to the Committee to Protect Journalists, or, you know, I would call it the Committee to Protect Gringos in this case, since they <laughs> really don't say much about the journalists in Nicaragua who were attacked by the opposition. But, you know, well before I wrote this piece, he was complaining to them, uh, he the the, the uh, government was looking for him. They wanted to deport him well before I wrote anything. But I wrote this piece just about his background and the background of the MRS, this U.S.-backed um, opposition party in Mint Press. Uh, the, I sent it to the Canary and I said, you know, this is about a Guardian reporter. You know, it would be good for people in the U.K. to know more about this and about how the Guardian has run this shabby campaign for regime change in Nicaragua very similar to the campaign for regime change in the Labour Party that they're running. Yeah. Um, and so uh, Carrie Ann and Ed Sykes, another editor at the Canary, actually said, you know, we, we let's let, went through more rigorous edits than Mint Press's editorial team, which was very good. I mean, Mint Press has a very professional operation. So they wanted to make sure that everything was tight. And we got everything together. We posted it. Nobody disputed a single fact in the story. And then a friend of mine in Nicaragua writes me and said, uh, you know, this guy Carl was just uh, picked up and uh, I think he's going to be sent home. And I said, OK, well, here comes like a tidal wave of insanity. And I totally predicted it. I said, you know, there's this guy, Shane Bauer, who's like developed this puerile obsession with me and Ben. Yeah, uh, and I've he's seen gonna be He's going to be the one to like start the campaign on Twitter. And so he does so and is like, Max Blumenthal got a journalist tortured and they're ripping his fingernails out right now. Uh, and then Jake Tapper from CNN retweets it and all hell breaks wow. loose. Uh, well, yeah. And, and, and uh, then BuzzFeed, you know, the guy you mentioned, Mark DiStefano, the water carrier, writes about how Carrie Ann Mendoza and the usual crew have gotten a journalist uh, thrown from a helicopter into the sea. <laughs> um, and basically, you know, what wound up happening was this guy, Carl, 
David Gide Lusiak was just simply put on a flight home. Nobody, nobody harmed him or touched him. And I don't, I don't know. People in Nicaragua are justifiably very upset that the entire Western media, after they faced this coup, has run a campaign against them to drive sanctions that are probably going to pass in the U.S. Senate uh, any day and will put them under the same kind of embargo they were under in the 1980s when 50,000 people died. I mean, it's the same campaign. And so we pushed back just a little bit yeah. in the UK and the US at all two alternative publications, and they blame us for basically uh, something we didn't even do. And Carrie Ann's lecture, I don't know, There's they, they turn up the heat on your lecture. By the way, we ran a follow-up piece from the oldest friend and closest working colleague in Nicaragua of this Guardian reporter, um, Carl David Gide Lusiak. Uh, his, his name was Wyatt Reed. He just came out of nowhere and said, you know, actually, Max, you're right. And I want to talk about this. And I've sent a letter to the Guardian telling them that Max Blumenthal is right. Uh, we might not have been CIA agents. Max didn't call them CIA, call him a CIA agent, but we were inhabiting the historic role of the CIA. We were participating in a regime change operation as publicists for the opposition. And I feel extremely terrible about that. And it's not our place as Americans to go to another country uh, with that kind of entitlement and to clamor uh, for the removal of a government. And then he said, you know, how many children will go hungry or without shoes uh, because of the sanctions, because of uh, tearing this country apart. The Guardian refused to publish that letter, so I published an interview at the Canary with him, completely confirming that we were right, that we had gotten it right, that the Guardian was partic was like just a direct participant uh, alongside a very violent opposition in an attempt to tear apart a progressive government in Latin America. And there was dead silence. Everybody just shut the fuck up because <laughs> it was just over. But the damage was done. And I mean, you can pick it up from here, uh, Carrie Ann. I, I, I do want to add really quickly, I want to add one quick, one detail that Max forgot to mention, which is a great detail. So BuzzFeed by Mark DeStefano published this piece on October 2nd. Oh yeah. And then the next day, quietly, right at the end of the piece, yeah. they issued an update. Uh, and they said, BuzzFeed News acknowledges that Max Blumenthal neither doxed anybody nor threatened violence and did not intend to Im imply beyond the reported facts that there was any indication Carl David was deported as, as a result of his article. So they they put this correction. The entire premise of exactly. the article, from the headline throughout, is that Max Blumenthal's article and the canary for publishing it was responsible for the doxing and responsible for this man being deported. That is not an update. That's a correction. That's it. This, this That's entire the article is false, is what they're saying. <laughs> yeah, everything you just read, by the way, just kidding. You know, it's absolutely outrageous. I mean, whatever you want to call that, it's sure as hell not journalism. Like, that is not journalism. To print something knowingly inaccurate and then just have a little caveat at the bottom saying, eh, by the way, completely not true is and, and, and i'll come back to that a, i'm really glad you read that out because it's really important so we already had this update we had the Wyatt reed story i'm thinking now that's it this is put to bed you know this was a really poorly constructed smear campaign that anyone with eyes can see through this is over right no later that same day mark de stefano announces He's again the water boy, the Guardian's water boy over at BuzzFeed. Says victory. The uh, the NUJ have stood up to the Canary. You know they're not hosting this speech anymore because of what the Canary's done with this awful poor journalist in Nicaragua. There's this awful statement from the NUJ's general secretary. This is the general secretary of my own union. <laughs> She doesn't mention the canary directly, but bear in mind, she knows she's given a quote related to the accusations, and it's awful. It's basically condemning the canary as an irresponsible outlet that has put a journalist at risk. They get these, I don't even know what you call them, like the BAME members of The Guardian. So think now, if you know a black or brown journalist at The Guardian, it's them, this little club. must be tiny. must be like five of them. 
They then write a strongly worded letter that's attached to this tweet by Mark Stefano saying, we could never host Kerry Ann Mendoza. She's put this journalist at risk. This is disgusting. Now, bear in mind, this is being released on Twitter 10 hours after that BuzzFeed update retracting the allegation that they are now using in this tweet as the premise right, for right. cancelling the lecture. So, you know, me and Max are both on at Mark Stefano going, this is outrageous. You haven't even mentioned in this announcement that the entire premise for, for these horrible statements, for this horrible decision, is false. It's based entirely on a false narrative. Nothing. Crickets. And they've just continued to repeat it. They didn't even, you know, there's no pause. There's no moment of reflection where they say, hey, guys, look, I know we really don't like her. I know she's really given us a tough time over the last couple of years, but don't we think this is a bit much? We're now lying. We're now actually actively, we know this is a lie because it's BuzzFeed are saying it's a a lie and they started the lie. Maybe we just need to calm the hell down. All we got to do is sit on our hands for 45 minutes. We don't even need to go to the speech if we don't want to. Like none, none of their number was able to have that conversation. And I think what I found most frustrating about it was there are Guardian journalists that I respect the journalism of. You know, people like Aditya Chakraborty, people like Gary Young. I've read their work in the past. Even Owen Jones on occasion I'll go with. You know, he's a bit tough thumping for me. But, you know, his heart's in the right place. <laughs> but even those guys, silent on this. You know, not a dicky bird. And I just thought to myself, ah, progressive except neoliberalism again. <laughs> Progressive except imperialism. Well, yeah. I mean, and no one really, no one in the UK really, in the in the whole media world, wanted to look at the merits again of the merits of the case, which is that no one disputed a single thing I wrote. No one. And then no one bothered to look at the discrepancy between the BuzzFeed update and the allegations uh, against you from The Guardian, which were just out and out false. Um, and then beyond that, no one wanted to do their own investigation, which would have led to the fact that in Nicaragua, people were clamoring for uh, some kind of, uh, you know, I, I, people were just up in arms about this guy, Carl David Gide Lusiak, uh, roaming around the country alongside the opposition. And, you know, really, he was just a symbol of the Western media for people and the symbol of the Guardian and what it had done to basically spread lies about their country and their government after they faced this destructive coup uh, among progressives who they used to think of as their allies in the West. I think that's probably the thing that's most offensive, I think, to Nicaraguans, to people on the left in Britain, you know, to people who were really at the crushing end of the, you know, the effects of austerity here is that these people who are putting themselves forward as allies, you know, that's the key word. They put themselves forward as allies. This is their central selling point of their entire publication is that, you know, we will back, we've got your back. We will fight these battles for you. And it's just white savior complex. You know, this is through and through white savior complex. Totally. Because when the, when it really comes down to it, you know, you've got Owen Jones this week going after the Telegraph over Saudi Arabia, but he's unwilling to take on his own paper. You know, he won't turn that fire on his own paper because ultimately he's he needs the income. You know, his whole career is at stake if he if he turns against his paper. And the platform. I mean, he's the guy he's fulfilling that classic role of the guy who kind of inhabits the left edge of conventional opinion. And he needs a kind of mainstream platform. As soon as he's pushed out of there, then he becomes like one of us. Yeah. Well, and also, Kyrie, you you've used the phrase progressive except neoliberalism, which is hilarious. It's a great concept. Yeah. But I actually think in this case, it's it's something even slightly different. It's progressive except imperialism, because you have this this new wave of kind of mainstream progressives. In the in the USA, is a phrase democratic socialist, um, but they don't care about imperialism. Yeah. They don't care about empire. The other. In the ca- case of the U.S., the other 95% of the world is in a my minor detail at best. In the case of the U.K., you know, the fact yeah. that the U.K. still has, it's still an imperial power. It still has this extremely aggressive international presence in foreign policy. That, that, 
those are just considered minor details and domestic politics is considered the purview of socialists, of democratic socialists. So you can have a foot yeah. in the door in The Guardian and in mainstream media if you say things like we have to defend NHS, we have to fight austerity. I mean, those are not the mainstream hegemonic views, but they're allowed. But what's not allowed is saying that we should actually dismantle the milita military industrial complex. We should withdraw our foreign troops. We should close these military bases. We should end these wars. That's no one is allowed to talk yep. about that at all. You're absolutely right. I mean, the basic assumption that you have to, and I mean have to, accept in order to operate long term in those circles, whether it's the Guardian or the Sun or wherever, whichever other paper you want to pick, is that it's, this is the nub. Capitalism is reformable. The only reason stuff's not working is because this, uh, eight, you know, X, Y, Z leader uh, isn't doing capitalism right. And so we'll do capitalism right. That's that's it. That's the breadth of the argument. That's as far as you're allowed to take it. And if you go to the point where you're saying, guys, I think the problem might actually be capitalism. I think there's some serious issues with this system and we need to look at transitioning to an alternative you know, not only to save the planet, literally, you know, we're, we're killing the planet for the sake of profit right now, but also, you know, to decrease instances of war, to, you know, redistribute wealth amongst more people, all of these things, it would be possible if we organized it a different way. That is like, you might as well grab a gun, basically, because the, the way you're looked at when you make that argument, it, I mean, they just quickly go to militant, extremist, as if, Anything outside of this narrow little window that they've got is far anywhere. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, Jeremy Corbyn's platform isn't far left. It's just left. You know, it was perfectly normal a couple of decades ago to say the, the types of stuff, stuff that he's saying. But by the standards of today, you are an absolute card carrying flag waving extremist. If you mess with that basic assumption, capitalism is reformable. You're just not doing it right. Well, and what's wild is that's considered extremist, but not people who think that corporations should be allowed to destroy the planet and the potential for human life to continue to exist for profit. That's not an extremist position. Like ExxonMobil should be able to destroy humanity. Ben, that's just business. That's just business. It's, and that's the thing. You're completely right. I mean, the, the moment you just add business to something then it's like it's not extreme it's just business is as if as if businesses aren't collections of people making decisions about what to do with other people and places as if it was just like some like an earthquake or something you know you go well no one can be blamed it was just an earthquake it's like no no what's happening in israel is not an earthquake what's happening in Nicaragua? not an earthquake you know, right. none of these things are just like a unavoidable natural disasters. They are man-made foreign policy, domestic policy, and corporate policy. All right. Well, we're going to have to take a pause in our conversation here. This was the end of part one of our interview here at Moderate Rebels with Carrie Ann Mendoza. Carrie Ann is the founder and editor of The Canary, which you can find at thecanary.co. And uh, in the second part of our discussion, we'll be talking about Jeremy Corbyn, the witch hunt against Jeremy Corbyn, the nonstop media smears and, and how these falsehoods come back again and again and again to try to destroy Corbynism. And then we're going to talk about Brexit and what Carrie Ann thinks about Brexit, the different political possibilities and what it means politically for the UK and Europe as a whole. Thanks a lot for joining us, Carrie Ann. That was a great discussion. Cheers, guys. You take care of yourselves. For listeners and viewers, you can support Moderate Rebels at Patreon. We are at patreon.com slash moderate rebels. Uh, please try to help us sustain the show so we can do the kind of interviews we're doing today with Carrie Ann and with other figures who are challenging mainstream corporate media. And please join us in part two. You can find it on iTunes, on soundcloud.com slash moderate rebels. And uh, look, look for us on social media. And you can find uh, this will be part one and part two will be up soon. Thanks a lot for listening.